All right. So I want to take this opportunity to welcome those of you who have joined us via the internet. And I want to remind you that God is at work. No matter what your situation or your circumstance may look like today, God is working. So if you'll trust him, no matter what you feel or what you see or even what you don't see or what you don't feel, if you'll just trust him and know that the God who promised that he would never abandon you, he continues to work out his perfect plan and his will in your life. Amen. Right? Amen. That's, that's the confidence I have. That God's working. Amen. Even when I mess stuff up, he's still working. Amen. It's, just, it's just, I mean, you got to know him like that. And you got to have that kind of assurance that in spite of what you see or don't see, what you feel or do not feel, that Jesus the Bible says he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And God said, sit here till I make your enemies your footstool. That's another reason why I know God's still at work. Because the enemies of Jesus have still got to be put down. Amen? Praise God. Well, in uh, Mark chapter 8, St. Mark chapter 8, there is a, a text that few have really digested because it's pretty strong. It's, it's, it's really strong. But then Jesus' words are always strong. And they have to be. Okay, when you're dealing with the kind of adversary that we're dealing with, you can't be, you know, weak-worded. Is that, is that a good way? Weak worded. Too many Christians are weak worded. They use weak words. All right. But Jesus used strong words like I am. We use stuff like, well, I might. That's weak, man. That's weak. All right. Jesus used words like I will. And a man came in and said, uh, Lord, you know, uh, Will you come to my house and heal my, I will. We yeah. said, well, uh, yeah, maybe I might. No, that's, that's, that's weak, man. All right, so he uses strong words because that's what it takes to exercise the authority that God had placed upon him to deal with the adversary that we have to deal with. Okay, when, you, when you're dealing with sickness and disease you can't be weak worded i don't care if it's just a cold you can't be weak worded all right make your words as strong as god's is all right whether it's cold or cancer and anything in between don't don't be weak worded man i feel like i just preach right there weak worded that word just that weak worded man all right all right uh, we're talking about humility, as you know, this year. God's been, been dealing with us about re-examining our disposition, how we, how we think and how we look, first of all, to him and then to ourselves. And it should translate in how we treat one another. Because the path of humility, and humility really is the state of being humble. It's, it's bringing yourself under someone else. So humility is really about us displaying the love of God to everyone. And in order to do that, if you're going to, if you're going to show people how much God loves them, you have to think about them rightly. Or else you'll have this big I, little you attitude that he talked to us about over the last couple of weeks. Amen. So when we look at humility, of course, our, our, our foundational text has been James chapter 4 that says God gives grace, more grace. So he says, submit yourselves to God. 
that's bringing yourself, bringing your attitude and your opinion under here in every area. Okay, what did God say about that individual? Right. Well, no matter how you see them, you have to bring your attitude and how you see them and how you think about them under here. Amen. All right. So in Mark chapter four, there's an incident that takes place, and at first glance, it would almost seem like Jesus was calling one of, one of his own disciples the devil. Okay. Yes. So let's go there. Mark chapter eight, verse thirty-one. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, and uh, I'm reading from the Common English Bible, and it uses the term the human one, which is Jesus' reference to himself. He must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and be killed. Now, if he had stopped there, man, that would have been, would have been dismal. But listen to what else he says. And then, after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and scolding him, began to correct him. Now, of course, Peter was known as being, you know, very uh, enthusiastic. He belonged to a group called the Zealots. Well, you don't get in the Zealots you know, being an introvert. All right, you get in the zealous because you, you come with it. All right? And so, and so Peter hears Jesus talk about everything that he's going to have to go through in the very, very immediate future. And their idea of Jesus was not one that, you know, could be conquered. Because they had walked with him and they had seen him deal with the devil. They had seen him deal with demons. They had seen him deal with sickness. They had seen him deal with storms. They had seen him talk to trees and they dry up. They had seen him walk through the midst of a mob that was trying to kill him. They had seen all this. So when Jesus starts telling them that, you know, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be handed over to the authorities, and the people that are going to be behind it are going to be the church folk. They're going to be the chief priests, the Pharisees. Well, you know, Peter wasn't trying to hear that. No, no, wait a minute. Lord, why are you talking like that? So then Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Now, it looks like he's calling Peter the devil, okay? But that's not what's going on here, all right? What he's literally saying is the, the statement that Peter makes comes from a human perspective. Now, as upsetting as it is to some people to hear, the human perspective okay. is not a godly perspective. Well, if it's not godly, it can only come from one other source. All right? See, we think that, you know, there's, there's, there's God, there's the devil, then there's us. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, uh, tell me if I'm right or if I'm wrong. Well, you either one or the other. Yeah. Follow what I'm saying? Ain't no in between. Okay, there's, there's, somebody said there's the right side, there's, there's the uh, wrong side, and then there's God's side. That don't make sense to me. All right? So Peter's statement comes out of a human perspective, which originates in the context of where they were from the devil. Ever since Adam disobeyed God, and brought into the world sin, he brought into the human experience and the human makeup a satanic and devilish perspective on everything. As evidenced in the very first statement he makes when God approaches him after his disobedience. 
he says to God, I was afraid. That's never, that, that was not introduced into the human experience until after man disobeyed and took upon the nature of the adversary. Before then, there was no fear because they walked with God and had fellowship with God. There was no reason for them to be afraid of God. All right? So at this particular time, the nature of man was still dark. So when Peter says, that's not going to happen to you, he's not thinking from a godly perspective. Now, when I looked at the text, I got to be honest with you. I didn't quite understand why Peter said that because Jesus said, and then I am going to rise after three days from the dead. Now, I could have understood if Jesus had laid out all of the suffering and stopped right there. But for him to say, after all this, I'm going to get up after three days. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, man, wow, boy, this oh, is this, going to go down there. Okay? But, but Peter's only looking at the suffering and the torture and the horror of the whole event from human eyes. And so Jesus identified that mindset as satanic. Okay. And he says, you're not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. So after calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their cross and follow me. What does it take to follow Jesus? What does it take? What, what does it really take? Now, again, you know, we're faced with, and I think we're going to see more of it uh, the closer we get to, you know, the end of all things. We're going to see more. In fact, Jesus said it. There's going to be a lot of people coming with different doctrines and saying, I'm the Christ, and I'm the one you need to follow. And I think that the church, by and large, seems to be poised for this kind of movement. Because until we get free of a human and worldly perspective, we're always going to look for these stars. And we're always going to be enamored with people who seem to be, as they say, larger than life which is a human perspective. And so I think the closer we get to Jesus' return, we're going to see more and more of these doctrines that rise and that say this is the way you ought to go. And the Holy Spirit led Paul to write uh, through his letter to Timothy to try and help Timothy understand and communicate to the members of the church where he pastored okay. that there are going to be some strange teachings come. Yeah. People are going to say, don't eat this and don't eat that and you ought to stay away from that, all this kinds of stuff. And he calls them doctrines of devils. Yeah. You ought not get married and all, just all kinds of stuff. And so we're seeing that and we're hearing more and more of that noise. And the attempt is to make it seem like that it's God when it's really not. So our adversary spends a lot of time trying to deceive. And if he, you know, you something to think about, if, if he was that bad, if he was that powerful, he wouldn't have to deceive. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, man, if, what, if I could just come knock you in the head and take your money, what do I need to con you for? I just come take it. But he can't do that. He doesn't have that kind of power. So he has to deceive. So Jesus says to Peter, you're not thinking straight. He had already told them on several occasions, 
what was necessary in order for him to fulfill his mission. But in their minds, they were still thinking from a human perspective. They were wanting him to establish this government that he came and started to talk about. They were wanting him to establish it in their lifetime. Because you remember a few weeks ago when we talked about uh, James and John bringing their mother in there? All right, so all the things that Jesus had tried to teach them to prepare them mentally for what was about to come, they just missed. James and John say we want, we want you know, positions on the right and on the left. And now here's Peter saying, this is not going to happen to you. So Jesus rebukes him. And then he says, look, anybody who wants to follow me, these are the requirements. You have to say no to your, to your ambitions, your agendas, your opinions, how you think, what you believe, the way you think it ought to go down. All of that has to be brought under him and his authority. And then he says, you have to, you have to take up your cross. Now, the cross... If you've been in the Baptist church, you know what the cross is. It's an emblem of suffering. And y'all know that, that, that song? The old rugged cross, y'all remember that? All right. I learned that. All right. But, but, but he's trying to prepare them for what is ahead. To follow me, here are some requirements. You're going to have to suffer. And see how people get quiet right there? See? Because we don't want to do no suffering. Oh, no, we don't want to do no suffering. What else you got, Rev? <laughs> All right. We don't want to do no suffering. Now, one reason is because we misunderstand the, the uh, position of our suffering. See, the position of Jesus' suffering was prior to redemption. Our position is post-redemption. Are you listening to me? And so the suffering that we are to are called to do is from a victorious position. There are things that we have to put up with, like being called all kinds of names. You follow me? And enduring some things that are they're uncomfortable to endure. But not because, you know, the devil is more powerful than we are and that we can't do anything about the uh, agents of the suffering. Because if that were the case, then Jesus never would have given these very men at one time, he gave them power over the devil. And they came back saying, we walked in this. And the devils are subject to us in your name all right so the suffering that he is calling upon us to do has nothing to do with what a lot of people think when it comes to suffering all right and and i realize that most of it is because we just have been just kind of ignorant of scripture okay people say well i'm sick i'm suffering for the lord i ain't suffering for the lord he never calls you to be sick all right. Well, they picked my car. Praise the Lord. I'm just suffering. That ain't suffering from the Lord. That's you not paying the note. You know what I'm saying? You know, they lay you off or they fire you because you refuse to compromise your Christian principles. Now, that's suffering. But in so doing, you should never be without are y'all listening to what I'm saying? In other words, okay, I got fired because, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to, you know, quit uh, spending my own break time, which they give me, you know, praying. I'm not witnessing anybody. They said not to do that, but I'm going to pray and I'm going to read my Bible. And they said don't do that. And so, you know, that's within my right. That's my time. So they fire me for that. Well, okay, Lord, now, you know, I got to work. 
You know, I have, I have responsibilities. Well, suffering for the Lord doesn't mean that all your stuff gets picked up because you got fired for standing up for Christ. Are you listening to me? Because Jesus said, one of, the, one of the requirements for following him in the Gospel of Mark, the book of Mark, seems to carry this as a recurring theme, following Jesus. Because on several occasions, we have this same theme surfacing. For example, the, what we call the rich young ruler, who came to Jesus and said, good master, what must I do? To inherit eternal life. And Jesus said, why you call me good? There's none good but the Father. Yeah. And then he lays out for this young man the, the, the uh, answer to his question. And this guy's looking pretty good. Mark chapter 10. He said, man, I've done all that. I've kept all those things. And Jesus said, one thing you like. Go sell what you have. Give to the poor. And come follow me. Amen. And the Bible says that young man went away sorrowfully because he had great possessions. In other words, he was rich. All right. So we have that as a theme. And then, of course, you know, Peter and, and the rest of the guys said, wow, man, you know. And because Jesus, after that guy went away, Jesus said, you know, it's just hard for rich folk to get into the kingdom. And Peter and the rest of the disciples were astonished. Why would Jesus, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, we wasn't, we wasn't on welfare when he called us. You know, they were pretty well off. So that shocked them that Jesus would say that. And Jesus perceiving that said, it's hard for those that trust in riches. And that was the young man's problem, not the riches, but he trusted in them. Okay, so, so, when he's laying out what it takes to follow him, Mark is full of these uh, episodes. So Jesus says, look, anybody that's coming after me, you got to deny yourself. Now, when I say his words are strong, that's strong. Because you remember the 100-fold principle. Those of you word folks, you know what 100 for. We like to claim a hundredfold return. Why? Because Jesus said, all right, whatever I give up for his sake and the gospels, I shall receive in this life a hundredfold return and in the life to come, eternal life. We, we know that one, right? But, but, but wait a minute. Let's back up before you start claiming a hundredfold. Did you read what he said you, got, you had to give up? See, that's the prerequisite to the hundredfold. His words were strong. Because in Jesus' thinking, if you weren't willing to forsake all to follow God, you couldn't follow him because that's what he did. And some of us, bless our hearts, have the audacity to suggest that, you know, well, God didn't mean as though we can interpret his words differently than what Jesus said. When he said give up mother and father, that's what he meant. When he said give up brother and sister, that's what he meant. Amen. All right? When he said wives, husbands, that's what he meant. Amen. In other words, if you put your mama, your daddy, your son, your daughter, your husband, your wife, your uncle, your, 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 your aunt, if you put them all before him, he said, you can't follow me. Well, you know, that's hard because some, some of us can't even put, I mean, forget spouse, we can't even put boyfriend or girlfriend under Jesus. You know, let them tell us don't do that. And we just, well, Pastor, I ain't going to be there because, uh, you know, uh, you know, just go on, tell the truth. Boyfriend said he wanted you with him. And, you know, 
he was more important to you than what Jesus said. So when you get married, you know, and I love this excuse. Well, you know, uh, God had families before he had the church. So far, you haven't said anything that wasn't, you know, there ain't no new revelation. All right? But when it came to the dispensation of the church, what comes first? All right? Your family or the body of Christ? So what Jesus says is, if it's all about you and you can't give you up, you can't follow me. That, my friends, is what humility looks like. It means that there is something more important than me. There's something more important than the way I see it. There's something more important than, you know, my opinion. There's something more important than my agenda, my ambition, my career, my profession, my, 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 my. That's what humility looks like. If you're going to be successful at this, Jesus laid it out for us. That's what's required. Now, because of the way we have thought, that seems like a hard thing to say and to do. And the reason we think that, again, is the same reason Peter said what he said. Because Peter's looking at what Jesus said from a human perspective, not from God's perspective. Amen. God knew that this was necessary in order for the human family to be set free. But Peter wasn't seeing it that way. So when he tells us we got to give up our family in terms of their importance in our lives, there should be nobody more important in your life than Jesus. I know you love your husband. I know you love your wife. I know you love your kids. God help you. If Jesus and your kids have to be decided between. But again, you look at it from a human perspective. Because to decide for Jesus is to decide for your kids. When are we going to get that? That he knows more about them than we do. When are we going to understand that? That he knows what the purpose and the plan of God is for mama and for daddy and for all the people that we seem to put before him. He knows better than we do. But that's what humility is all about. It's saying, you know what? You know better. You know what's better for them more than I do. I can only see through a glass dimly but you can see all things all things are open and naked before your eyes I can't pull back the veil of flesh and see what's in their heart but you can so to put Jesus before all of them is a vote for them you're not doing them a disservice to say no to them and yes to Jesus It's like, you know, just simple things. And I, I'm going to get touchy for some of you. But just simple things when you look at it. Again, you, when you go through the Gospel of Mark, you'll see that he's, it, this is full of it. He's saying stuff like, if you are ashamed to own me before this adulterous and wicked generation. That's in Mark. I'm going to be ashamed to own you before my father. So your relatives come to town, you don't even want them to know you're a Christian. You've been going to church every Sunday, faithfully serving God. But relatives come to town and, you know, you won't even ask, you won't even invite them to come. They make you feel ashamed for coming. I'm just saying. 
if you put them before him, you cannot follow him. Jesus' words were strong. Let me share this with you because I see by some of your face. You need the Holy Spirit to work with you on this a little bit more. This is, this is, this is nothing new to the plan of God. Because you can go back to the book of Genesis. When God told Abram, look, Abram, I need you to leave your father your kinfolk, yes. everything that's familiar with them. Well, I mean, wait a minute, man. My, my dad, you know, he raised me and trained me and, you know. And so for God to require that of him seems hard. Yeah. Yeah. But he told Abram, in you, yeah. I'm going to bless everybody. Yeah. But, but for me to do that, you got to come away from them. So Abram had a choice to humble himself and say, okay, Lord, if that's what you require, I'll do it. Knowing that the outcome was that not only were people that he never knew going to be blessed, but his family, his father, his kindred, they were also included. In other words, God didn't pull him away from his family because he didn't like his family. He pulled him away from his family so that he could bless his family. So when Jesus says, look, if you're going to follow me, these are the requirements. I can't take a second seat to anybody, not even you. So what you have to see is if I follow Jesus, it's going to be better for boyfriend, girlfriend. It's going to be better for husband, wife. It's going to be better for son, for daughter, if I follow Jesus. You, you understand what I'm saying? That's a difficult thing for people to grasp. And yet Jesus says, that's what it takes if you're going to follow me. Because at some point, I can promise you this. At some point in your relationship with whoever, he's going to require you to do some things that they are not going to understand. And then it's going gonna, it's gonna to show whether or not you really love him the way you say you do. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads. Lord, we thank you for clearing some things up for us. Your love for us, for our families, for our friends. Though some may question it, we certainly do not because you demonstrated your love through the suffering that you endured. We thank you, Lord God. Help us now as we continue to dissect and digest what you said to us so that we examine each area of our lives to make sure that it falls under what you will, what you want. Help us in our thinking so that we understand that when we make the choice to follow you, we're also making a choice to be a blessing to others. We thank you for that. Now, those of you who are watching, on the right of your screen, there's a, there's a box that says, accept the invitation. The invitation didn't come from me. The invitation comes from Jesus because he's the one that says, whoever comes to me, I will not turn you away. So if you'll click on that box and follow those simple steps, they will lead you right to the feet of Jesus. And he can become a personal, personal Lord to you, personal friend to you, a brother to you. That's what he desires.
We thank you so much for watching, and we look forward to you joining us again next week. For those of you who are in this room,